Well, if you've been with us these last few weeks, were you wondering what the song of the morning was going to be today about money? We are wrapping up our series that we've called uh, Money Talks. As we've been talking about stewardship, we've been talking about uh, the last three weeks, that subject that's near and dear to all of our hearts, and that's our money. And we've been sharing some thoughts along that, specifically talking not so much about how to separate us from our money, but talking about how to make us successful with our money, how to make us financially healthy as followers of Christ. It's not about how much we have or how much we don't have. Financial health is totally independent, doesn't depend upon anything in terms of the, the quantity. Financial health is independent of that. And we begin a lesson about talk, in talking about financial health. That they said the foundation for that is to answer the question, who owns what? Who owns it all? Well, we discovered from God's Word that He owns it all. And that's really the first step toward financial health is transferring ownership from ourselves back to God. We go through life and we can easily get that twisted and turned backwards. We begin to think that we own it. It's my car, my house, my clothes, my income, my investments, my retirement. And we get that backwards. It's easy for that to happen in our culture. And we come back to God's Word and God says, no, I own it all. The earth is the Lord's and everything that's in it. And we are, therefore, as followers of Christ, we are managers of it. We're stewards of it. We, we discovered that takes all the pressure off of us. When the car breaks down, when the washing machine stops running, when the investments go down, we can say, no big deal. It's God's. It, that's God's car. If God wants to get his car stolen or have break down, that's up to him. I'm just a manager of it, a steward of it. I'll take care of it, but I no longer have to sweat the small stuff because it all belongs to God. And then as we talked about transferring ownership back to God, to get the monkey off of our back, to relieve us of pressure, to, so we don't have to fight about money. We don't have to worry about money anymore because it's all God's. We talked about certain coins in the financial health, and I identified four coins. And when these four coins are in balance, we achieve financial health. And the coins are simple ones that we all have. The coin of, of in, earning, uh, income, spending, giving, and saving. Those are the four coins that make up financial health. And when those are in balance, we discovered that we no longer have any frets about money because we've achieved financial health. And then we learned that according to the Bible, the most important of those coins, because it's probably the most difficult one to manage properly, is the giving coin. And so we spent a, some time talking about giving, how to be free in terms of our giving, to make sure that's in balance with the other three coins. But the giving coin brings us under the umbrella of God's protection and of God's blessing, we discovered. And that's so important. That in the only time in the Bible God says, test me, he says, test me in this. If you get the giving coin right, test me and see if I don't open up the windows of heaven and bring you blessing beyond what you can receive. Not just financial blessing. We said that's, that's too small. The blessing of God's presence and his counsel, his wisdom, uh, on and on we could go, his comfort, his strength, his peace. As God says, test me and see if I don't pour out blessing to you and protect you, to bring you under the umbrella of my protection. That's why the giving coin is so important. And then last week, Mike zeroed in a little bit more on this topic of, of giving, this coin of giving. He taught some biblical principles that really should be our guide in terms of how to give. Principles that I want to just reiterate, that we are to be priority givers, that God is first. We give him first and foremost. We give him what the Bible calls first fruits, not at the end what's left over, if there is anything, but we say, God, we're going to give you, pay you, and provide for you first and foremost in our giving. And then we're prioritized givers. We give to the place where we have been blessed. For many of us, that's the local church. But if you're blessed in a ministry, God says the principle is that's where you need to include them in your giving, the places where you're, you're blessed. And then passionate giving. Passionate givers, learning the joy of giving so that we become cheerful givers. Uh, sometimes we think what we need to, that you'll hear it, give until it hurts. The biblical principle is give until it feels good, until it brings a smile on your face. 
joyful, passionate givers. And then finally, the, the principle of being a, a pro, proactive giver, one who has a plan for our giving, that we're prepared to give. It's not just, oh, uh, there's an opportunity, I better dig for the smallest bill I'm carrying and throw that in somewhere. No, we're, we get rid of that. We are proactive givers. We have a pla- Biblical givers have a plan for their giving. And so today as we wrap this up, I want to try to tie it together as we conclude this series. And, and I said three weeks ago when we started it, this is really a series of talks uh, mostly for those who are followers of Christ. If you're not yet a follower of Christ, uh, you've gotten a free pass for these three weeks. You can listen in and say, well, what, what's the Bible say about giving for those who are followers of Christ? But this doesn't pertain to you particularly. You may say, I, I'd like when I become a follower of Christ, I, I want to have that, f- that financial health. But these really are talks that we've given from God's Word that engage all of us who say, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm one who has invited him into my life. I'm walking with him, and I want to become more like him in all of my life. And these are principles from God's Word. And just to reiterate one more time, remember our, our goal of this, we've not, it's not a fundraising campaign. We're not raising money for anything. I told you we're not trying to separate you from your money. Our goal in this has been to increase your financial health and to increase, therefore, our financial health as a church, that we are healthy in terms of the money and the possessions that God has given to us. And this morning I've asked another one of my friends, members of our church, to share with us just a little bit of his experience in these principles of giving and these different coins of financial health. Someone I know and has observed has learned this in his own life, in his own family. And so I'm going to ask Mike Pontiff if he would come this morning and I just ask him to share with us in regard to the, the question of uh, what difference has following these biblical principles of giving made in his life and in his family. So, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you share that with us this morning. Thanks, Gary. My own? Oh, there we go. Thanks, Gary. Um, so I was very uh, thankful to have this opportunity uh, to come up here and share with you guys. Uh, I, I grew up in a family that was... Uh, I was fortunate enough to be taught basic financial principles, what, what I called thrifty, but what some of you guys may have called cheapskate, okay? Because, <laughs> you know, it was get all you can, you know, and, and don't spend it. And we'd go to McDonald's, and my uncle would buy a hamburger with no cheese, like the kid-sized one, and, a, and get a cup of water, okay? This is a guy with a full-time job and, you know, money, and he still has a bunch of it. And, and this is the kind of environment I grew up in. So you've got to get it, but don't spend it because you've you got to get it. It's, it's great when you have it, and it feels great when you have it. So get it. So that's kind of how I grew up. Um, when I became a believer at 16, I started reading the Bible. I was amazed how much it had to say about money. And I found this parable uh, that Jesus taught uh, in Luke chapter 12. It says, and he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store all my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I'll store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with uh, whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. And I was like, wow, that's, that's conviction for me because that's the way I always grew up was, you know, get it, just like a pirate, you know, just go and get as much as you can and, and give nothing back. It's just, it's just get it. And uh, as I matured as a believer, um, I started to see myself in that parable, and I, and I tried to free myself from that, and I moved into a stage of uh, real legalistic giving. You know, well, the Bible says tithe, so that's what I'm going to do. And so I gave 10% strictly. And, you know, and it, was, it, was, it became very rule regimented for me, and, uh, and, and so that's what I did. Um, but then one day, uh, a friend of mine named John Schmidt, uh, I just, just became a brand new lieutenant, United States Air Force, first time with a real paycheck in my life. And, uh, and, and a good friend of mine named John Schmidt, he's in the mission field, and he, uh, at Texas A&M University, he goes and he outreaches to Chinese students who come from China to uh, learn, you know, school and go to university, and then they go back home after their time. And he specifically seeks them out and has functions for them and, and ministers to them and teaches them. And through his ministry, he's seen many come to know Christ, and they go back, you know, to a hostile 
environment back home where there's, you know, where, where the, the word of God is prohibited. And, and, they, and they live, you know, much differently than you and I would. But John reaches these people purposely. And he, he came to me one day and he said, Mike, I want to have lunch with you. I'm like, oh, great, John. Yeah, we're good friends. We'll have lunch. So I sat down with him and he said, I want to invite you to partner with me in my ministry. And, and I realized he, he had me, you know, because he brought me to lunch and everything. And, uh, and I'm like, wow. So now my legalistic mindset was really shaken up. Like, well, if I give to my friend John, does that count as part of my tithe or do I separate it for something else? And where is it? And I'm digging in a word and I can't find anything where it says, like, you know, you have to give this much to your church and this much to what. So I really, my legalism kind of got shaken up there. And, uh, and I started reading some other scriptures. God loves a cheerful giver. And we need to give where we're called to give. Uh, Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So is it good for me to partner with my friend? You know, I feel God leading me that direction. And, and yeah, it is. I need to partner with him. I need to. And 16 years later, I still give regularly to my friend John. and He's still doing the work of Christ. And there's still the gospel going back to China. And I feel like I'm part of that because I partnered with him. And God led me to do that. Another lesson I learned, I said, uh, I need to give till I feel it. And, and just like uh, Gary said, you know, we got to give till it feels good, you know, but I was giving out of my surplus and my wealth, you know, and there's a parable about that with the widow's uh, might, you know, she gave two copper coins and all these other wealthy people gave out of their wealth. And Jesus said, she gave more, she gave more. And I was giving out of my surplus. I was giving the leftovers, but I needed to give so that I felt it. So I didn't need to constrain myself to some rule like 10% legalism. I needed to give till it felt right, until it felt good. And so the last thing I needed to learn, or I learned was uh, I need to give where I go. You know, uh, it would be really selfish of me to come in uh, to Frontline today and, and, and sit under the, you know, the lamps and the heat and, and enjoy some coffee and put my kids in a Sunday school where they're cared for, you know, it sounds like the, so I hope they're being cared for. And, uh, you know, and everything's going well over there. And, you know, and then to hear a, a professional and, and trained pastor come and teach me about the Bible and then walk away and say, man, I, I just, I don't know, that, that church has got one bathroom. I really don't like that place. You know, I'm not going back. You know, that'd be really selfish of me to come and enjoy all these things that cost money and not contribute to, to support it. And uh, so, you know, what am I doing to fix that bathroom? You know, I need to give. And he said, you know, I'm going to write a note and put it in with my offering and say, we need more bathrooms. Here's $2,000 or something. You know, I don't know, whatever. Just I'm not going to do that. But if God <laughs> led me to, that's what I would do, you know, because that's how we're supposed to give. You got to give where you go. You got to give and support the, the ministries you're involved with and your, and your pastor and your local church. So I learned those lessons. Um, and then the next groundbreaking was uh, Proverbs um, 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. I wasn't a good budgeter. God taught me that I needed a budget, and uh, my wife was very good about this, and she always wanted to, and I was like, ah, whatever, we got money, let's not worry about it. You know, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing kind of mentality. You know, that's what I thought. But it's not, it doesn't apply with, you know, with, with diligence and giving, and so um, we started planning and having a budget, and we did that through financial peace. So Gary asked me a question, all that intro to say, Gary asked me a question. He said, what, what, what impact have these biblical principles have on, have on me? And uh, I summarized it in five. It's, it's freedom. There really is a bunch of freedom in there to give as I feel led. So when somebody comes to me with a need, because I've planned and I've budgeted and I've taken care of and I've been a steward, I can meet a need. Somebody says, man, I really need, a, I really need this or, I'm, uh, you know, I, I don't know how I'm going to come up with the money for this. I just say, hey, don't worry about it. I got that, you know. Just pay it forward or uh, whatever you need. Or if a new missionary comes along and says, I need some support, I can say, you know what, we can make that, make that, uh, meet that need. Uh, I can meet needs without a concern of financial upheaval. I can trust God in the end to work everything out. I don't need to worry about, because it's none of it's mine anyway. It's all his. I'm just, I'm just a steward of it. Also, following biblical principles, it's increased communication and unity in my marriage. You know, my wife and I don't fight over money anymore. We used to, but not anymore because we're unified. Every month we sit down twice a month and we talk about the budget and that's it. We don't talk about money all the time. We just kind of stick to it and we're unified. It's given me wisdom to instruct my children in financial matters. My, my children probably don't like this very much. Yes, Stacia's giving me a look right now. She's like, oh, I wish she hadn't read this. But my kids at the age of 13, they get a card 
a debit card. And I put $30 on it, $20 on it, whatever it is, every, every two weeks. And I say, I'm not buying your clothes anymore. I'm not buying your bathroom stuff anymore. Good luck. And you know what they learn? They go, great, you know, Cinnabon, here I come, you know. And they just go crazy. But they learn the same lessons you and I do, but when they're younger. And so they apply those now at their youth. And they go, man, I don't have any pants. Dad, can I have some pants? I gave you thirty. I gave you sixty dollars last month. Where's that? Oh, I don't know. You're learning. Okay, good. Welcome to reality. You know. And so now they realize, oh, I can buy pants. And if I go to the thrift store, I can get three of them. And if I go to KMCC and buy something, I'm going to get just one. So you know, I'm able to apply this to my family, and they learn. They learn financial principles. And lastly, contentment. Uh, how many of you guys have heard that verse? I can do all things through Christ to give me strength. You know, one of the most epic verses ever, like you can apply it to skydiving and just, you know, whatever you want. God's going to give you the strength to do it. Yeah. But in context, the verse is actually about contentment. It's, it's given, I like reading the message version of it. Uh, Paul writes this from prison. I'm glad in God. From prison, he wrote that. I'm glad in God. Far happier than you would ever guess. Happy that you're again showing such strong concern for me. Not that you ever quit praying and thinking about me. You just had no chance to show it. Actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, and with much as with little. I've found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. Mm. Paul learned the secret of contentment in his money and his finances and, and, and to be in need and to be in want. And, and because of that, he practiced contentment. He didn't worry about money. He, doesn't, you know, he wasn't like me at the beginning trying to hoard it. And he's not like you know, a future me trying to get as much as I can and spend it and, and have a great lifestyle and everything. It's, he, he learned contentment. No matter what the situation, he had to focus right. It was all on God. And I want, I want that recipe. You know, I want that same recipe for happiness and contentment. And the key ingredient, as you learn here from the scriptures, from the one who makes me who I am. That's Jesus. You know, he's the one who makes us who we are. He's the one who set the example. He's the one who made it so that we could understand money. And he gave us a lot of instructions about it. So the car doesn't define me. My house doesn't define me. You know, the clothes I'm wearing, they don't define me. What defines me is God and, and who I am in him. And there I can find contentment. So no matter what struggles come, just like Gary's saying, car breaks down, man, that's, God, that's God's car. You know, I just got to let go of my selfishness and my attachment to worldly things uh, and practice that. There's a great song by uh, Cademan's Call. Maybe you guys know it, but the, the lyric goes like this. This world has nothing for me, and this world has everything. All that I could want and nothing that I need. And that's true. That is so true. You gotta apply that to your life, and you'll find contentment. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. You know, I, as I was hearing Mike, I thought that's really what we want, isn't it? I want that. I want that. That's called financial health. That peace. Lack of worry. Can you imagine never having to have a discussion, uh, a fight over money again? Never have to worry about finances? I appreciated Mike sharing those principles from God's Word. God's Word has a lot to say about our money. Jesus talked a lot about money. He talked more about money than he did about heaven and hell, believe it or not, and possessions. He talked about money matters so often Because he knew that money matters so much. And he wanted his disciples to get it right. So this morning, I want to just summarize, I think, a lot of what Jesus had to say about money. Some principles that produce financial health or that express financial health. We're going to just look at three of those. Uh, First one we find in an encounter Jesus had with a man who came to him and asked Jesus how you get eternal life. Where do you find that? He wanted this eternal life. And so he asked Jesus about that. We find that in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to look at three Gospel passages. Uh, the first one will be Mark, and then we'll look at two in the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to turn to the second Gospel, Matthew and then Mark, Mark chapter 10. 
probably a familiar story to some of us about a rich young guy who came to Jesus one day. In Mark chapter 10, verse, starts in verse 17, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How do I get to heaven? Is basically what he's asking Jesus. Well, why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Someone has said that for every 100 people who can handle adversity, only one can handle prosperity. Jesus wanted his disciples, those who were following him, to be among that 1% who knew how to handle the stuff that God's given to them. And that's not as easy as it might appear because the danger we find from this story, the danger of money, possessions, is that it can become an idol to us. And the Bible says idols keep us from God, prevent us from following Him completely. And so Jesus wanted to test this young rich man. He wanted to test where his heart was, what his idols were. And so he told him, he said simply, I want you to sell all that you have. And I know you have a lot, but I want you to sell it, and I want, to give it, I want you to give it to the poor. Not because Jesus needed his money for the poor. Jesus could feed the poor however he wanted. But he wanted to test the man's heart to see if there were any idols in his heart, to see what was keeping him from following God. Was he willing to worship God and serve God only? Or did he want to worship God, but also alongside that, he wanted to worship his money? So he wanted to have two masters, God and his money. And Jesus tested the man's heart. And obviously we see how that test came out. The man said, no, if it comes right down to it, I really love my money more than I want to love God. And so he walked away empty-handed. This man saw no difference in trying to do both. There was place for God, certainly, but really money was his God, was his idol. And Jesus said, that cannot be done. I'm sorry, you just can't do it. Matthew 6, 24, he says this, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. That's the fact of the matter. First principle for financial health is we have to decide, are we going to love God and use money, or will we love money and use God? I know that sounds pretty stark, doesn't it? But that's what Jesus said. It boils down to that. Is something in our lives, money or whatever it might be, an idol? It keeps us from God. We can't love both, he said. It's an important decision. It's the first principle of money that Jesus taught, that we're not to fall in love with our money. He says, don't fall in love with your money because doing so will keep you out of heaven. And that's exactly what happened to that rich young man. Loving his money kept him from experiencing eternal life because he had an idol before God. For some people today, that's still a, a tough decision. And Jesus said to his disciples, after the man walked away empty-handed, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not because they have money, but because they fall in love with their money. Some of us, if the truth were known, have fallen in love with our money. And Jesus says we need to get that right. You can't love God and love money at the same time. It's impossible. It won't happen. The stakes are huge for that decision. And that's why Jesus said and warned us, don't fall in love with your money because doing so will keep you out of heaven.
And while his disciples were scratching their heads and trying to get their minds around that principle, Jesus offers them a second principle about money that was equally as challenging. We find that in a parable, a story that he told in the Gospel of Luke as we turn over to the next Gospel. Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, verse 16 to 21. Jesus tells a story about another rich man. This one is fictitious, a, a parable. But he's a rich fool. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops, beginning in verse 16. This story that Mike re referred to. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. The Bible says in Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship is not here, not on this earth. Our citizenship is in heaven, the Bible says, Philippians 3.20. And once we recognize where our true home is, that's a huge guide for how to navigate life in this temporary home. It helps immensely. You see, we won't bother storing up everything here and hoarding it for ourselves on this earth because we'll recognize that this is only a temporary place. This isn't my real home. I'm going someday to my real home if I'm a follower of Christ. It turns our focus from this place to that place, our eternal home. Randy Alcorn in his little book, The Treasure Principle, a great little book, said, I'm convinced that the greatest deterrent to giving is this, the illusion that earth is our home. That's an illusion. That's not true. That's simply not the case for followers of Christ. As the old song puts it, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. That's a biblical truth. Our citizenship is in heaven. And that's the second principle of money that Jesus wanted his disciples to follow. To use your money, your possessions for eternal gain rather than for earthly glory. To know that you can lay it ahead and set something there for where you're going, your real home, your eternal home. That's a great challenge for us, isn't it? To have that perspective that we're just temporary residents here. Our real home we're still going to. In our travels as, uh, over the years, Suzanne and I we generally tend to stay in cheap places, but every now and then we'll splurge on something that's really nice occasionally, and uh, I like to surprise her with that. One of those times we, I did a little splurge was when we were traveling in northern Italy in, on Lake Como, and there's some beautiful villages around there, and I thought, we're going to do a little splurge, and uh, there's a little town called Verena just next to Bellagio. Maybe some of you have been there. A wonderful little place right on the lake, and I found a hotel there that had a beautiful room, corner room, top floor, windows overlooking the lake. When you open them on one side, you could see uh, north or toward the Alps on a clear day. The other side, you could see across the lake. And on this side, you could see the little village of Bellagio. It was incredible. I mean, gorgeous. And we stayed there for several nights and enjoyed that place immensely. Great memories. Now, we still talk about that and sometimes look at some of those, uh, those photos. But you know what? As we stayed there, we never hung any pictures on the wall. We didn't recarpet the place. We didn't paint it. We, we didn't put new doors or windows in it. We, we didn't do any of that thing, those things. You know why? Because we recognized that we didn't live there. That's not our home. We're just getting to stay here for a time and to enjoy it for a few days. We're on a sojourn. That's not our real home. And I think that's the point Jesus was making. That's why it's important to recognize that this earth is not our home. It's only a temporary place that we get to live and to enjoy and sometimes have to endure until we as followers of Christ go to our real home, our home in heaven in God's presence. And so as we, we review our earthly lives, Jesus wants us to ask, do we see evidence of that second principle? Do we see evidence that you, we've been using our money for eternal gain? 
rather than for earthly glory? Does how we use our money and possessions reflect the fact that we recognize totally that this is just a temporary place, a place we get to stay in, we get to enjoy and sometimes endure, but it's temporary. We don't have to bring carpet, paint the walls, and change the windows because it's only temporary. We can take what God has given us and use that as well for eternal gain, not just for earthly glory. And while Jesus' disciples wrestle with that one, that principle, he confounds him with a third principle, one more that left everyone amazed. We find that in the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon that Jesus ever gave and preached. Also in Luke 12, we find it recorded, uh, verse 33. He says there, now provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out a treasure in heaven, similar theme, that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems backwards to me. When I first read that, I think, is that, did he say that right? Did they translate that correctly? One of the things I love to do is I love to ride my bike. I love to, especially get out on the roads, and here in this part of Germany is just awesome riding. And every, because I love to ride my bike, every few years I do indulge in buying a new road bike. And I love that. It's because something I love to do, I spend my money there with what I love. And that seems to me from that that really my money follows my heart. But Jesus says, not really. Oh, yeah, there are some examples of that. But he said the deeper truth is, no, that our hearts follow our money. Interesting, isn't it? In other words, the true test of what's really important to us is seen in where we put our treasure. What we, what we say is important to us may sometimes take our money. But he says if you really want to know what's important to you, what your values of life are, watch where you put your treasure. Because where you put your treasure, that's, that's where your hearts are. Wow. That hits pretty close to home for me. Sometimes I think I can say where my heart is, but do I show that and where I put my treasure, God's wealth? For most of us, I think treasure can be defined... Uh, Maybe the couple things, certainly our money, but also for us Westerners, a part of our treasure is our time, isn't it? Where we put our money and our time pretty well defines what's important to us. And that's the third principle that Jesus taught. He says, let your treasure, let your time and your money, your treasure, take your heart to the place it needs to be. You want your, you want your heart to be more inclined toward following Jesus? Jesus says then, Let your treasure lead the way. Where you put your treasure, your hearts will be. And so when Jesus looks at my calendar and my checkbook, the two things that characterize most my treasure, he knows exactly where my heart is, what I value most in life. And I do too. I just have to look at those two things, my calendar and my checkbook. And I can tell you where my heart really is. Sometimes and that can be a sobering examination to say, wow, I, I say it's somewhere else, but this really shows it where it is. Other times it can be a great affirmation and saying, yes, Lord, that's, that's where I want my heart to be. And I want it, my heart to be there, so I'll put my treasure there and my heart will follow. Well, there you have it. Three simple principles that summarize what Jesus taught to his disciples about how to handle God's possessions, how to have financial health. That's it. You've survived a series on giving and money. And no one separated you from any of your your cash, have we? We haven't had plates here. We haven't fundraised. We haven't had you sign anything. We haven't had you make a commitment. We've just said we want you to be healthy. And here's the prescription for health. So what do we do with that? How do we respond? I hope you will respond. It's like going to the doctor, you're not feeling well. And he says, well, 
here's all you need to do. These three things. And we leave and we say, the choice is ours. Do I want to feel better and get healthy? Or do I want to just continue the same practices I've done before I went to the doctor? Jesus says, do you want to be healthy? Are you tired of, wor- are you tired of worrying about money? Are-, are you tired of living outside of God's umbrella of protection and blessing? Are you tired of fighting about funds? Are you tired of just the stress of finances? Then he says, let me tell you how to get rid of all of that from this day forward and find financial health. And so now the choice is ours. What will we do with that? Will we walk away and say, well, that's great for somebody else, but I I still like my financial failures. I I like just to wallow in this garbage. I don't think we're going to say that. I think we're going to say, God, thanks. We want to get healthy. We want to find the joy of following you with our funds. And so let me suggest three simple responses of how we can react and respond to the things you've heard these three weeks, whether you've been here all three or maybe just today. The first is that giving coin. Remember I told you that's the, most tough, that's the toughest one. Mike shared that and reiterated that. And that is, if you, don't, if you don't have a regular giving plan, start one. If you don't give regularly, get started. Out of your monthly income or budget, set aside something from this day forward to God's work. Wherever God has blessed you, wherever you're being caught, taught, encouraged in your spiritual life, start giving there of the first fruits. Start now. I'd encourage you to do that. And remember we've talked about that. Start uh, from the beginning. It's not, wasn't planned this way, but we're coming up to the first of the new month. <laughs> uh, and so you might say, I'm going to just, okay, I'm going to try that. And I want to ask you to do something. God asked you to do it, really. Test him. Test him for three months. Just start for three months. November, December, January. Say, God, okay, I'm going to follow yours. I'm going to, we're going to try this. Wherever you are, maybe you haven't got, been, ever get, been giving. Maybe you've been just kind of playing around the edges with it. But start with biblical giving in November, December, and January. And if after those three months God doesn't come through, he says, okay, you tested me and I failed, you can go back the other way. It didn't work. He says that, and, and that's okay. But I, my sense is that after three months, if you practice these biblical principles of giving, not as an exchange, not bartering with God, not an issue of prayer, but with good motives, biblical motives, you'll find that God will come through in ways you never thought possible. So that would be step one. Step two, if you're already give regularly and consistently, just continue it. Continue on. If you do that, ask God to increase your joy, to show you how you can become a cheerful giver. That's not something that's out of a legalistic uh, approach to it, but continue doing it. Ask God to show you the next step that he has for you in terms of your giving. Even as Mike shared, it was giving, but then God said, you know, you can go beyond that and bless others, and you can do more than you ever thought possible, and God will bless you. And then the third step is to make sure you have a plan for your four coins. You only have four, but make sure you have a plan for them. Your earning, your spending, your giving, and your savings. It's that simple. Once you start giving to God's work regularly, you need to have a plan for those four coins. That's called a budget. I know that's a bad word for some of us. A budget, I hate that restriction. There'll be nothing more freeing in your life and your finances than a budget. Just a plan, a guide. Why let the world have a plan for your money? Why don't you have a plan for your money? That's what a budget is. I encourage you to start that. If you don't have one, you're handicapping yourself financially. As God's steward, and if you don't know how to do that or where to start, that, that's what Financial Peace University teaches so well, and that's why we've been running that this, the last month or so. Uh, let us know. We'd be happy to help you. Somebody come alongside of you, and they don't have to look at all your details, and they're not going to go into all your finite personal stuff, but they'll help you figure out how to do a plan so that you can have that freedom as well. Randy Alcorn, in his little book, The Treasure Principle, tells a story. I want to close, up, close with this. A story about visiting some friends in Egypt. And they were missionaries there, and they visited these friends. And 
uh, in the course of talking about missions and what God was doing in, in Egypt, his friend said, I want to take you to a, a place. I want to show you a, a couple of very interesting graves. And so he took him first to a, a grave site. It was kind of in a nondescript area and neighborhood of Cairo. And he said, this is the grave of a man by the name of William Borden. And they walked into this place, this kind of dusty old little grave site for some uh, Western missionaries. Actually, were, uh, some were buried there. And they found this grave printed on the tombstone was William Borden, 1887 to 1913. It seems that William Borden, as he writes, was a, a Yale graduate, an heir to great wealth, and he rejected a life of, e of ease in order to bring the gospel to Muslims in this part of the world. Rather than spending his fortune on himself, Borden gave away hundreds of thousands of dollars to missions. After only four months of zealous ministry in Egypt, he contracted spinal meningitis, and he died at the age of 25. Alcorn says, I dusted off the epitaph on Gordon's, uh, Borden's grave, and after describing his love and his sacrifices for the kingdom of God and for Muslim people, the inscription ended with this phrase I've never forgotten. He writes, it said, apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. And then his friends took him, him and his wife, to another place. Took him from Borden's grave to the Egyptian National Museum. If you've been in Egypt, you know that's the place of King Tut's exhibit. Tut, the, the boy king, was 17 years old when he died. He was buried with solid gold chariots and thousands of gold artifacts. His gold coffin was found within gold tombs, within gold tombs, within gold tombs. The burial site was filled with tons of gold. The Egyptians believed in an afterlife, one where they could take their earthly treasures. But all, the treasures, all these treasures intended for King Tut's eternal enjoyment stayed right where they were until they were dis discovered by a man named Howard Carter in the burial chamber in 1922. They hadn't been touched for more than 3,000 years. And Alcorn says, I was struck by the contrast between, between these two graves. Borden's was obscure, dusty, and hidden off the back alley of a street lined with garbage. Tut's tomb glittered with unimaginable wealth. Yet where were these two young men now? One who lived in opulence and called himself king is in the misery of a Christless eternity. The other who lived a modest life on earth in service of the one true king is enjoying his everlasting reward in the presence of his Lord. Tut's life was tragic because of an off, awful truth discovered too late in life. He couldn't take his treasures with him. William Borden's life was triumphant. Why? Because instead of leaving behind his treasures, he sent them on ahead. That's what biblical giving does for us as well. It allows us to live as citizens of the kingdom of God and enjoy life here in this temporary home, but to discover what it's like and what it means to be financially healthy, to see God's blessing and protection on our lives because of what He's entrusted to us and the way we've been stewards of it. That's been our goal and that's our prayer, that every one of us, individuals, couples, families who are following Jesus would find that financial health to give you freedom in serving Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we're thankful this morning, thankful to be your people, your people who find your guidance for us, your guidance for us in terms of our lives and even our money and our finances. You don't just bring us into your family and say, good luck, go it on your own, but Lord, you guide us how to be financially healthy. And that's what we want to be. We want to be that for as good citizens of your kingdom, those who follow you. And I pray that you'd help us as a church to be financially healthy, financially faithful with all that you entrust to us, we pray. Guide us, direct us, Lord, bless us, that we might be good stewards of all that you give to us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <music>